Mr. Dijsselbloem, thank you very much for being with us. I was reading your book and I was also listening to your interview with the CNBC and actually I was surprised that you didn't consider the Italian crisis too dangerous, too contagious. So first I would like to ask, uh, is the Euro crisis over or we are about to see a next episode? I mean, if you look at the um, current state of the economy in Eurozone and all the work that's been done, the Euro crisis is over. The growth is on average 2%. Budgets are roughly balanced, again, on average. Unemployment is going down in all of our countries, but there are still vulnerabilities. And um, if you take the, the wrong turn, and if you introduce policies that are simply not sustainable, uh, you can just wait for next problems to show up. The reason why I say the current situation in Italy needn't be contagious to other countries uh, are twofold. First of all, Italy, for a large part, finances itself. Both the, the banks and the government get the largest part of their financing uh, from domestic sources, domestic pension funds, investors, banks, etc. Uh, and secondly, the other countries of the Eurozone are in a better state and have taken their precautions. Now, whether that's also enough, also for Greece, we will have to see. But um, Greece can do a lot to, to show the outside world that it's in a, better, in a better place and on a different track than the Italians. Mm -hmm. I will come to Greece later, but let me first refer to some broader, I think, political conclusions or facts raised during the Euro crisis. Populism was one of them. Losses for the socialists in Germany, in France, in the Netherlands, of course in Greece, was another. Are these two related? Why so much lost ground for socialists? Well, there's a couple of things going on. In the Netherlands, populism started far before the crisis. We had um, Pim Fortuyn in the elections of 2002, who almost became the biggest party. Pim Fortuyn was uh, shot just before the elections, but that was the start of populism in the Netherlands. Populism in Denmark was already quite strong. Populism wasn't just caused by the crisis, but it has made it much more severe. I think in many of our countries, people are disappointed, disappointed in their economic situation and outlook, uh, and also issues of security. And this is where migration comes in, whether we agree with that or not. To many people, migration is not considered as a good thing, but is considered as a possible threat to their security. Now, Europe has always provided prosperity and safety for people all during those uh, years of integration, post-war period. And since, I think, the turn of the century, that has changed. Migration has become a big issue in all of our countries. And on top of that, we had the financial crisis with its disastrous effects. And I think the, the voters of Social Democrats are simply disappointed by uh, those crises that have uh, had a real impact in their lives. So it's also quite clear what should be done, mm. and that is to manage migration, improve security, and get the economy back on track. The question is whether we can convince voters again that on those two key issues, managing migration and improving the economy, we have uh, the best approach, the best proposals, the best ideas. And my warning would be, don't follow the populists, however attractive that may seem in the short run to become as tough on migrants as extreme right or as fiscally irresponsible as the, the hard left. Don't go that way. That way, We are, Social Democrats are a moderate left movement and should come up with realistic approaches and the honest story about what can be achieved and what cannot be achieved. And closing this topic, same question about you. I assume you left the position of the Eurogroup's president more experienced and wiser. So you have said that it is too early to retire. What's the next challenge for you? I don't know. I can't tell you yet. I have decided to, um, after leaving the Eurogroup, to have a, an in-between year. The British say to have garden leave. So I've written a book. I write op-ed. I write a column in the Dutch uh, newspaper. I travel a lot. I teach and what the next job will be, we will, uh, we will see later on. So let us come to Greece. It is the only country that concluded the third out of its three fiscal programs, and we are still far away from the markets. I would say that the Eurogroup gave Greece time to see how it develops and then monitor how the markets react and decide then, is this true? 
in the short run, does, uh, Greece doesn't have to go to markets. As you know, Greece is fully financed, fully funded, and even has uh, access to a, a, a reserve, a cash reserve, which they may uh, need in the coming uh, years and may use in the coming years. So going to market is not uh, urgent for financing. Of course, gradually you need to show uh, that you can be trusted and that you can, uh, over time, finance yourself again. The most important thing there is not to rush to markets to get money. The most important thing there is to show that your policies are sound and that anyone who lends money to Greece can be sure that it won't be ill-spent, that it will be used wisely and that the public finances are sustainable and that the economy is gradually improving. So it's very much about showing, I guess, first and foremost to the Greek people, but also to the outside world, Mm. that things are improving and that the government whomever that government is, uh, will take a responsible position. That is a, the, the most important thing at the moment. Going to markets will gradually take place. All the other countries which implemented their fiscal programs regained market access and growth decisively returned there. Is this only a matter of ownership of the program by the authorities or, in the Greek case, the European reaction, especially during the first years, came too little too late. As I've written in the book, I think that the first years in how we handled the crisis, also in Greece, not just in Greece, was not the right approach. We saved banks everywhere in Europe by bailing out the investors, and that was very costly, and that led to high sovereign debt in many countries. Even in the Netherlands, we had to save three of our biggest banks at a huge cost. It happened in Ireland, it happened almost everywhere, and also in Greece. And of course, that was part of why the sovereign debt, which already was very high, shot up even further. So that is part of the story of Greece. That's part of things that should be avoided next time. In the current situation, it's very much about creating the right economic dynamics. And um, yes, countries like Spain and Ireland have quickly done some very necessary and yet difficult reforms in their labor market, the pension system in Ireland, in the housing market, in the banks. And Greece has simply not, uh, you mentioned ownership, that's a term that very often is used. Greece has always been reluctant to take those difficult measures, which perhaps has led to an even longer recession rather than getting out of it soon. Some days ago you wrote an article saying that Greece has a point on non-implementing the pension reforms, the pension cuts. Which is this point? Is it contradictory to the fact that Greece should implement responsible policies? And wasn't the same point there one year ago? Now this is about the very specific additional pension uh, measures and they simply don't have a structural impact. So looking at the pension reform, there are perhaps two reasons why you want to do it. One might be that you want to save money, austerity. The other one, that you want to improve the long-term sustainability of your pension system. Now, the first reason is at the moment, in my mind, not valid because the um, fiscal effects of this measure are not structural and the primary surplus targets are already being met. So you don't have to do it from a point of saving money. And also the other question, does it improve, structurally improve the pension system? The answer is no, it doesn't because it's an an aging uh, part. It's the older people that are already in the pension system many years. That's why I said, I think the Greeks have a point here. It's not a structural issue and there is no direct fiscal need to do it. But you're right. The other side is um, the outside world could get worried and say, ah, so Greece is not going to stick to the reform course. So I would say if the Greek government shows that on a number of topics they are moving ahead, alternative topics, then that should give comfort also to the outside world to show that Greece is still very reform-minded and forward-looking. It is clear in your book, and it is obvious, that trust between Greece and its EU partners was destroyed back in 2015. Where do we stand now? No, I think that we are in a much better position, obviously. We've had some very tough talks and negotiations with Prime Minister Tsipras and with Minister Tsakalotos and others, but they were serious talks and there was a constructiveness between us. Uh, And that's a huge difference to the period in the first half of 2015 when the uh, then Greek minister basically didn't show respect to us. He just came in the Eurogroup to tell us that we were all fools. That didn't go well, of course. That wasn't appreciated, but it also created an atmosphere in which we really didn't make any progress. And if you just think 
back to the first couple of months of 2015, not only did the Europeans lose confidence in the future of the Greek economy, but also the Greeks. I mean, money was running from the banks. Investors were running from Greece in that first half year and created a lot of damage, unnecessary damage uh, to the Greek economy. There are some key persons in your book related to the Greek drama. And there is also a reference that after the destructive Varoufakis period, you're saying that uh, Greece asked for help from the US. In fact, uh, a representative participated in the negotiation meetings. Did the country ask for this help? And which was the role of the US during that difficult period? What I do describe is Mm -hmm. that the Americans were involved because they, that was of course the Obama administration, was convinced that it was crucial for Europe, for Greece, for international security, that Greece should be embedded and remain embedded and part of the European Union and the Eurozone. So the the Americans were very strong on this and very much involved. Uh, And I think they were advising everyone. So sometimes Mm -hmm. an American economist would be part of the Greek team, then an American, another an American economist or a former minister would call me and then call Tsipras. So they were involved in all sorts of ways. To my knowledge, and correct me if I'm wrong, a key person who tried several times to find solutions when there was the impression of a dead end in front of us was Thomas Wieser. I'm making a specific reference to him because in Greece there is always a misleading perception towards the bad Europeans and this is rather unfair, totally unfair for some people. So I would like to ask you to remember a story addressing Wieser's contribution to avoid Brexit. We would have to ask him, I guess, but I can remember at one point that um, the German Bundeskanzlerin, directly or indirectly, but again, you, you would have to check with him, uh, asked him to go to Athens and to talk to Prime Minister Tsipras and the Finance Minister, and I think this was in the first half of 2015, uh, to talk to them to at least explain what the possibilities were and what the impossibilities were. If you remember, we were talking to the Greek government in in 2015 about changes to the program and of course some changes are also are, are always possible but i remember that thomas wieser specifically traveled to athens outside of all the formal negotiations outside of the troika etc to simply sit down with uh, the greek minister and to try and convince him of what could be done and what simply could not be done to get some realism on his side. And this was just one of, I guess, many moments where Thomas Wieser's experience and economic insights uh, were very important. Last question on Greece, and I know that you are involved, you are writing this in the book, in this topic. Are you concerned about the rule of law in Greece? I'm asking on the basis of your EU case. This court case is extremely damaging to everyone. It's uh, extremely damaging because because the outside world may think that this is a case of uh, a political witch hunt. And I think it would be, but again, you know, the Greek legal system uh, must be able to do its work independently. But the damage from this ongoing case, the damage to Greece, to the credibility of its institutions is really serious. So the better this case is closed, uh, the sooner this case is closed, the better. And it seems to me like a case of, a clear case of blaming the messenger. You know the expression, don't shoot the messenger. Here the messenger is taken to court again and again and again. And I, and again, you know, the damages to, to Greece and its institutions, the independence of its legal system are very big. So let's, let's hope that this finishes very quickly. Two questions about your book. Why a Greek citizen should read this? And also why a Greek politician should do the same? I would say to both the politician and the citizen the same. First and foremost, in Greece in the period before the crisis, then in Greece and in Europe uh, during the crisis. And we really need to make sure, and I'm sure that this is a sort of a common, a joint interest we have, is that never again Greece loses its political and financial uh, independence again. And this is possible. I mean, it's just, it, it really is a matter of good policies. It really is a matter of addressing the problems well in time. Uh, and if you pursue good policies and address problems in time, Greece can do so much better than it has done in the past. But it requires that we do learn from the mistakes we made, all of us. Finally, I would like you to think of a story that isn't included in the book, a Euro crisis story, I mean. There are none. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, the. When you write the book, you I've written it from my own experience, my own memories. So in all fairness, it is, of course, only a part of the story. 
everyone that was involved, ministers, policymakers, central bankers, even journalists, could write also a part of the story from their perspective, their memories, their experiences. So what I think is relevant, what I have in the forefront of my memory, I've put in the book. I can't think of any stories that I've missed. Mr. Dijsselbloem, thank you for being with us and uh, thank you for sharing this interview and these stories with us.